Hello, my name is Martin Dugiamas from Moodle. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Um, I've got a little bit of time here to tell you what's going on in, uh, in my head, in my world, and uh, uh, be happy to talk to you afterwards, uh, wherever that's possible on the, the conference site. Uh, thanks very much to Nextcloud for inviting me to speak. Um, real pleasure to do so, and uh, I'll share the screen now and show you a few things while I'm talking. So, uh, look, I really want to talk about Moodle Cloud, um, uh, Moodle, sorry, and Nextcloud together, and um, particularly the things we share um, and the values about why openness is in education is essential. Uh, I'll talk a bit about Moodle first, uh, a bit of a catch up, some overview of what we're doing. Uh, then I want to talk about the Moodle and Nextcloud integration work that's been happening and continues to happen. And then I want to really dive into the big issues of the future. So the last year, of course, uh, this year has been um, uh, an incredible one in the education field with at the peak, we had nearly 92% of all learners in the world uh, having to study online suddenly, or being at least taken out of school. And as a result, there's been all kinds of upheaval in education and a lot of decisions being made and a lot of changes being done. And uh, it's been a crazy, crazy year if you're in the field um, that we are in education technology. Uh, current stats of Moodle LMS in the world are installed. We have 160,000 uh, registered sites. These are ones who've just pressed the registration button. Of course, being open source, we don't really know all the installations and it's um, a good deal higher than that. But still, if you look at the statistics, there's 30 million courses on those sites and you know it's a significant uh, proportion of the world. Those numbers jumped from in February, there was 100,000 sites registered and it went up to 160,000 sites since then. So you can get an idea of the kind of growth there's been in 2020 uh, with people wanting to go online. Uh, in the Moodle world, uh, though, it's not just our LMS. Uh, we also have a, another LMS for workplace. It's based on that one and it has uh, extras. I'll cover that briefly. We have apps to access these platforms. Um, and these are the tools that we make. We also have uh, things, resources that we provide or organize. So the Moodle partners are our uh, network of service providers around the world. We have Moodle Cloud, which is a SaaS platform, uh, mostly for smaller sites. We have Moodle Net, which is a new social network. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and we have development partners of all kinds that, uh, that we work with, including Nextcloud. Uh, on the skill side of things, we uh, have an educator certification, um, and I'll cover a little bit of that. And we have Moodle Moots, their conferences that run in different places all around the world. They've all gone online, and uh, we're actually restructuring them because we probably will always stay online from now on, um, like many other things, even after the virus is solved. Uh, globally, Moodle's got a very high penetration. I mentioned some raw numbers, but in, in the higher education space, this is what it looks like for learning management systems. And you could see uh, in some continents, each one of these is a continent, that uh, can go up to 80-odd um, percent. The place where Moodle is, faces most competition, really, is in the US, in North America, um, where there are large proprietary LMSs um, that we, that we uh, uh, compete with. Although we don't really look at it like that because we're the only open source one and we, we're doing our thing. And we're doing it for however many people are in our community. Um, so we operate on a different level from a, a proprietary company. I will talk about that as later as well. But overall, it's about two thirds of the world's universities and higher education use Moodle in some way. So the big thing that we are focused on here in the Moodle community is a, a big focus on UX, uh, user experience. Moodle has been around for uh, 20 years or so. It's an old code base. It comes from before social media existed. That gives you an idea. 
and there's a lot of UX that um, that needs to be updated for the modern world. And we've been doing it slowly, slowly on our six monthly releases, uh, but we are focused on uh, spending an extra whole year to really do some big changes. And there will be a couple of uh, six, very small six monthly releases happening in November and next May. But by the end of next year, we have 4.0. It's a good time to, to really express that UX focus. Um, so we have a number of really large projects. We're overhauling all the navigation across the system, uh, search and menus. Uh, we're focusing on the process of creating a course so that teachers have clearer and, and better support around creating courses and hopefully with higher quality. Uh, we're focused on the student experience how they know where they are, how they know what they've done, what they still have to do. Um, and we're fitting all these together with a new design system. And that includes uh, a component library, but also um, uh, just a new philosophy for how we fit those together. There's also a whole ton of little small, what we call low hanging fruit, um, little obvious things in UX that we know we need to fix and we're tackling a lot of those as well. Uh, the Moodle community is not just the, the core LMS though. We have uh, 1,730 plugins and climbing. These plugins extend Moodle with extra functionality. You can see a couple of the most recent updates here uh, from the front page of our plugins uh, database. And we have uh, a very interesting new approach here in that um, we are keeping all those, all those are GPL by the way, and they will always remain GPL. It's required to be part of our plugins database that you, you have plugins that are under an open source license and particularly GPL. But uh, many of our users can't install those plugins and have the value of them because they need to get their university admin or IT person to install that code and they may be wary of doing so. They might not trust it or they don't want to maintain it and, and so uh, some of the the benefits of this open source project don't get to the end users. So what we're building is a plugin service and we're turning basically all of those, those apps into an app store and we'll be serving them uh, up through the LTI standard so that they look like they're part of your Moodle site, but actually they're running somewhere else on a cloud. And so that will be a subscription service. And that means even teachers can install plugins um, from a, an app store um, without needing admin approval. Um, well, you know, the admin probably still has to allow them to do that, but um, it won't affect the installation or any, anything else they're worried about. Uh, the, the other LMS we have, Moodle Workplace, which is, as I said, Moodle plus these extra features um, focused on the workplace, multi-tenancy and uh, organization hierarchy and so on. Uh, this is available through our partners only, um, but these features are all coming into the main Moodle um, core LMS uh, as well, over, but over time. So the next thing in Moodle 4 will be the report builder that's gonna be landing um, from Workplace, and that's a really fantastic thing that allows you to build reports using a graphical interface, very, very common need in the Moodle community. And here's a big glimpse of uh, what Moodle Workplace looks like. It's very popular, it's going very well. Some huge projects are using Workplace, um, uh, such as Network Rail, the rail system for the UK, uh, military, uh, all sorts of things, quite interesting applications for Workplace. Um, another one of our projects is Moodle Net, and it's been going for a while as a kind of a skunk works project. We've had, uh, uh, we're building a social media platform for educators, and the primary goal of that is for educators to find others like themselves who are teaching the same subject uh, and to share resources and to collaboratively curate the best resources for teaching that subject in that language at that level. So uh, this will be released tomorrow, actually, the first beta, 1.0 beta, Moodle.net and um, it's simple at this point, it's still being still early stages, but the most exciting thing about it is it's built as a distributed federated system. So there's not just one site, there's many, and there will be many, 
and uh, it's a big experiment, uh, but we, we, we have some good hopes for it. It's really something that's missing in the education world today is a, a decent system for curating the open education resources that are around. Uh, the last little project I want to tell you about from Moodle is that we have a Moodle Educator Certification Program. Uh, this isn't just for certifying how you can use Moodle. This is Moodle's program for certifying that you are an educator. Uh, and that includes 22 competencies that come from the uh, European Union, uh, and it's called DigiComp. They include, uh, you know, professional engagement and, and how you manage digital resources and, and assessment and teaching and learning. These are kind of moodly things, but also, you know, how you facilitate your learner's digital competence and, and empower them and so on. So we have a, this detailed uh, certification, which anyone can take, come to Moodle. Um, it doesn't teach you how do you do these things. It just certifies them. So you need to be a pretty good teacher to take this certification. Um, it's not a couple of hours, this takes weeks. Uh, but you do get, at the end, a very nice certificate and uh, hopefully it's really worth something to you because um, it's, uh, it's about 200 euros to get the certification uh, and it um, is, as I said, a, a quite high quality and deep certification. So let's talk about uh, Nextcloud and Moodle in the education space. Um, I'm a big supporter of Nextcloud. I'm a huge fan of privacy and open source, as you might imagine. And I, I love that Nextcloud are really tackling the space that it is. And I fully support it, uh, doing what I can from my end to help support that. And part of that is to get our integrations um, better and better. So the first round of integrations that we did was from December 2018. Um, most of this work was done by some community members, Moodle community members, who were also using uh, Nextcloud in the University of Munster. Um, we have, so firstly, and these were brought into core by our team and, and then our standard features that uh, Nextcloud can be a repository inside Moodle, which means you can say, whenever you want to add a file or use a file, you can say, yep, get it from my Nextcloud installation. Um, Moodle also will use Nextcloud as an OAuth 2.0 authentication so source. So you can log into Moodle using your Nextcloud account. Um, and so, in these ways, it's very similar to our Google and our Microsoft Office integrations. Uh, we wanted to have Nextcloud in there as an equal, um, uh, an equal member of those, you know, like a, uh, with the same sort of functionality. So there was an open source alternative, but we want to take that further and further now and make Nextcloud the best integration for this, uh, this sort of functionality. So phase two, and by the way, the colors I'm using here indicate really who, who's, who's been doing the work. So these are blue because this has been done mostly by the next cloud team um, with a bit of support from uh, our team. So the Moodle app now can also authenticate from the next cloud site. And uh, so when you're logging into our Moodle app, if there's a next cloud SSO set up, you get sent to the next cloud site, everything works perfectly. Um, the Nextcloud dashboard widget, there's a new one and it shows upcoming Moodle events and uh, recently accessed courses from the Moodle site that's connected. Uh, and lastly, there is a search integration so that when you're in the Nextcloud search, you can find Moodle stuff. And, and here's a bit of a couple of screenshots showing that work that's been done lately. Here's the, the Moodle notifications on the dashboard and uh, here's the search in operation. So there's a couple of really good steps forward. Um, that is not nearly enough. So we're starting work on phase three and we're deciding on the features and I'm going to tell you some of the things that are on the list that are still being discussed and prioritized. And this is where if you're interested in this whole thing, you can actually start getting involved and helping us decide what it is and also hopefully help us build this stuff. So the first thing we can do is we could synchronize Moodle groups with the next cloud circles. Uh, that would be very handy uh, in the documents, for example, that are only available to a particular course in Moodle, that only those people enrolled in the course can access that document, things like that. 
We can also be synchronizing the calendars between Moodle and Nextcloud, a pretty obvious one. Um, I'm sure there are hacky ways to do it now by iCal and things like that, but it would be nice if it was just kind of automatic when you connected one Moodle with the Nextcloud. Uh, there's a task manager in Nextcloud. It would be great if we could see Moodle tasks appearing in there. So perhaps, you know, assignments that are due appear as tasks to be managed in Nextcloud. And, and overall, just more smoother, transparent, single sign-on. Uh, we shouldn't always be having to log on individually to lots of systems. The, the more we can make it seem like one system, I think the better, uh, particularly when you're thinking about a school or a university uh, in the education environment, um, the more transparent we can all make it together and seamless, the better. So it's something to research. Uh, a big one for me is to make it easier for a teacher on the, in the Moodle side to embed a document from Nextcloud as content and have a very clear decision to say, is this something that's collaborative or not? Is this content I as the teacher am putting into the course for students just to read? Or is this something that I want everyone to work on together? And we want to make the whole UX around that and other things a lot simpler. It is kind of possible to do it now, but it's not easy to discover or set up. Um, basically, all the UX on the Moodle side, there is a lot of little things we can do to make it easier and more transparent. And it might include some next cloud work to get that uh, slickness. But if managing documents in Moodle, but keeping them in Nextcloud can be done smoothly, I think we have a real winner here for the open source proposition. Um, I think we, we could also be showing Nextcloud in the Moodle dashboard, which has its own blocks and um, panes. Um, so we could show recent files in there and notifications coming from the Nextcloud end as well. Um, there's obviously work to do on what that UX looks like, but I think that's a promising area of development. Uh, the last one I see as a possibility, and this might be mostly on the Nextcloud side, is uh, at the top of Nextcloud where there are all these, uh, the icons, the plugins. Um, I forget actually what Nextcloud calls them, they're not plugins. But those, um, those features, uh, I think there's room for a Moodle icon to appear in there to be very explicitly have a drop down or access to a dashboard to show what's happening on the Moodle world. So it could show at its simplest, even just a list of all the courses you're in to make it easy to jump to them. Um, but it could also show Moodle's dashboard in there as well. It's a possibility. So some work that could be done there. If you're interested in joining in on this phase, there's no timelines on it yet. Uh, we're committing as much resources as we can, but we would love the communities on both sides to who are interested to engage uh, with us, help us drive this forward. Um, the place to go, I've set up a Moodle tracker issue for it. Um, this could easily be one on the Nextcloud side as well, but if you go to moodle.me slash Nextcloud, that will take you to the tracker issue and you can uh, subscribe to that issue and start putting comments and, and you know just express your interest, I think, just to get everybody together and talk about what we need to do. So that's it for the next Cloud Moodle integrations. Uh, interesting work there, and uh, I, I love uh, next Cloud. I, I really want Moodle to work better with it, and you know, I'm committed to with Frank from the next Cloud site to for our teams to be working together on that and uh, and making it a better and better thing. But let's talk about the future um, and a more wider scale. Let's say a global scale and the kind of environment that we're in, and why are we building these things, um, and what should we be building is, is an important question. The UN uh, some years ago came up with the 17 sustainable development goals. These are basically the most pressing problems that the earth is facing right now. And um, you can see a lot of hot button topics there. Um, obviously climate action and uh, equality of many kinds, quality education, um, reducing poverty, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we support that? And I'm thinking in the education field, uh, how does education support that? But how can we all be supporting that? And, and what, what are some of the issues? So here are some issues that are just to zoom in a bit, a little bit more 
detailed about some of the things that we're facing, some of the bigger problems under that that, that we, we need to be looking at. So one of them is that the, the, the whole pandemic has really forced a lot of people to evaluate and reevaluate what being remote means, what it, what it means to not all work together in a room. This was a trend happening anyway, and I feel that it's time that we have good systems to work together and learn and do all the things we need to do um, online. Now, that comes very core to where do we do that? where are the spaces for working and, and educating and doing all these things and who runs them? Um, it starts getting more and more important when we are putting our private information and our data and our lives effectively into a system as to what's going to happen with that information. There's another big trend of artificial intelligence versus human work. Uh, I don't know if you've seen some of the, I've been following it for decades, but in, in the last year, the advances in AI have been quite exponential. Um, there is one particular called GPT-3, which comes from open AI. It's been trained on uh, billions of documents. Uh, this AI is a general AI that you can put onto um, problems that we previously thought were only, uh, that only humans can do and it can do them easily. It's not an, not an intelligence as such, but it's just a statistical engine that given a word or a situation, finds the next word to put in and the next word and the next word. But for example, people are using it for applications like, you know, describe um, an app to it and it will create the app and the code to make that run or give it a sentence and say, write me an article or a book, and it will complete the article and the book, and actually it's a pretty easy read. Now, it may have factual errors because it doesn't know anything about what's true or not true, but it will write things like a human would write them and make, you know, you could easily make a system to say, uh, create a new Wikipedia from scratch, you know, write millions of articles about everything, and this AI will go and do it. And a lot of people would find those articles, perhaps in a search, and think, oh, yeah, that's truth. That's an article written by somebody. In fact, it's all just being generated by this machine. So when we have uh, AI of that level taking away human jobs, what does it mean to be educated? How do we operate in this new environment where machines are generating more and more of the information that we have? How do we know? How do we separate? And we come down to also like formal education and informal education. I'm a big supporter of formal education. I think a society should plan its education and its topics, and we should be very intentional about what our next generation needs to know. Um, there is a big battle, if you like, between that and everything else, right? The internet is full of information that you can learn from and, and, and uh, educate yourself, and it's terrific. But there are some issues, people going into, uh, you know, there's filter, but the filter bubble problem. So you might learn a lot about one thing and then not very much about everything else. Um, and that leads to problems like in democracy. How, how can you vote for somebody or how can you participate in democracy if you know only a lot about one thing? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's an issue. There's also the problem of fake news, as I said before. So much potential for um, misleading um, stuff. And we are seeing it more, strong, more and more strongly all the time, uh, how social media is distorting the truth um, continuously. Now, lastly, this is a big one that I'm sure is very near and dear to anyone who's at a Nextcloud conference, which is the big tech versus open. The centralization of technology versus decentralization. That is the issue, the biggest issue that we as technologists uh, should be fighting for. The more, and if we wrap all these things up, if you have an education system that is built on top of centralized for-profit technology, then 
our education, our news, our information can start to be swayed and distorted by commercial interests. If those commercial interests are connected to governments or whatever, you have a lot of quite scary possible scenarios. So, so what do we do to keep education being the best possible thing for society? Well, let's, let's look at what the best future is for, for tools, resources, and skills in, in education. I showed you this before, which showed the Moodle activities under tools, resources, and skills. If we go wider, the more generically, um, tools should be open education technology. Resources should be open education resources. And uh, skills should be open recognition. Now I'll talk about these in, uh, in a little bit more detail, but the open education technology is pretty clear. I think it's uh, open source. It's technology that evolves because the community is driving it. Uh, it doesn't have commercial interests embedded in it. It doesn't have prices that are going to uh, cut out huge portions of the world. And um, it has the flexibility to evolve. Resources. Um, open education resources. The uh, last year, UNESCO... Uh, which is a uh, collection of all, almost every government in the world, passed a recommendation to their own members, which is every government in the world except the US, to focus on open education resources, which is terrific news. Um, that means less on paying publishers to for expensive textbooks, more on building and supporting open education resources, uh, you know, documents and, and data that is open and under Creative Commons licenses and, and open licenses like that. So that's, that's well established. This last one is still very new, open recognition. So there is something called open badges, which is a, a start towards this, but that's not all of the problem. Um, the problem is once you've learned something or once someone has recognized you, for something, how do you give that to others in a way that is um, that you can trust? So if someone comes to me and says, oh, I know about this thing, uh, how can I be sure they do know about this thing, you know, without actually testing them? Uh, and what I want is a, 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 someone who certifies that they're good at that thing um, or someone I trust and I want a trustworthy way of that being stamped so that I know. So there's a lot of work happening in this field. It's very important for education, of course, because the, once you've learned something, you wanna keep the knowledge of that and you wanna store that somewhere. Uh, we do not want to all be using LinkedIn. Uh, first of all, you can lie all you want on LinkedIn and it'll be accepted as truth. On my LinkedIn profile, it says I invented LinkedIn and I did that just to show that it's very easy to lie there. Um, we want something more, um, a better framework, uh, an infrastructure that's open, that we can all trust. And that's what they're building here. So I'm gonna focus a little bit deeper on the open ed tech because that's more re related to what we're all here about today. Um, there is an organization that I'm launching called Open Ed Tech and openedtech.global is the website. It's kind of new, but it's, it's not actually doing much itself. It's really an association of companies that fit a criteria to be called open ed tech, and they'll be able to then have an open ed tech, open ed tech um, certification that says that this project is uh, fitting the principles of open education technology. And some of the companies that uh, fit under their umbrella, they, we haven't actually got the, uh, the certification as yet, but this is to give you an idea of the kind of projects that, that do fit. Things like H5P or Mahara, which is a portfolio system. Uh, Open edX is a MOOC platform. Kohara is a library system. Uh, Matrix is a really interesting project about messaging. Uh, so text messaging as well as audio and video. I, if you don't know about it, I highly advise you go look at matrix.org. I would love to see Nextcloud be integrated with Matrix. Uh, MoodleNet, the social network I mentioned, uh, Nextcloud, of course, 
Um, EduMeet is a video conferencing platform uh, produced by Giant. Giant is the connection of, or well, the collection of all of the uh, network providers in uh, Europe. Uh, Big Blue Button, a very well-known video conferencing classroom system. Uh, Badger, which is a, an open system for managing badges, open badges and, uh, and Moodle and so on. So these are some of the, the projects that will be involved in some way. Um, our job is to promote the brand of open ed tech as, as a brand so that people can understand that, you know, yes, this project has the right idea and these ones, but the other ones don't. Um, it, it shouldn't be about what is cheaper. It shouldn't be only, it shouldn't only be about where it comes from. It should be about how is this software constructed? What are the principles of it? What's the sustainability of that software? Will it be around for a long time? And how does it integrate with everything else? So uh, with the tools, resources, skills, we've got OET and open source, open education resources, uh, and here are some other um, people who've been involved making that happen, and then the skills, badges, and, and open recognition. So let me just tell one little story, one little thing that I think uh, uh, that, that might be where the future of education is. And I, I wanna drop this seed in here um, and see what people think. So you may have noticed uh, in the informal learning space, especially, there's a lot, a lot of collaboration. And I, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of what's happening on YouTube to a certain degree. I don't like that it's YouTube, but I do like, what I do like is that there are so many teachers there um, who are all contributing to each other. Everyone's learning from each other. There is uh, an easy way through algorithms and tagging and so on to find related stuff. And so we have a network of people learning from each other and the same on social media, you know, with, with all the, the problems of it, there's so much good stuff happening. And what we're effectively doing is we are all learning together as a society, but uh, you know, about politics, about current news, you know, we're like nodes on the network and together we're kind of thinking like a big brain uh, and that's happening more and more and more. Uh, it's across countries. It's across any organizational structures. It's just, you know, the world on the internet is connecting more and more and learning from each other. This is a great thing, but as we, as we know, you also see people going off into these filter bubbles and, you know, learning how to be a great Nazi or something. Um, it's, it's perfectly possible to learn everything this way. And so there's no inherent um, support of the SDGs or, you know, the global context it's just people learning from other people which is just good to point out the second trend i'm seeing is this uh, uh the emergence of let's say gurus i'm going to use the word gurus now guru is a, a hindi word that means basically teacher but there's a lot of uh baggage that comes with the word guru when i what i want to use it for is because i'm talking about a very high level teacher someone who's really good at what they do um, is able to actually produce a feed of interesting content, you know, as that teacher evolves and learn, learns, they share that and they have followers who are interested in that and are following with them. And there's a constant uh, feedback loop of, you know, the, the followers are saying they love it. They don't love it. They, they you know, further ideas. And then you have, um, uh, you know, ongoing growth, everyone's growing together, but there is a, a guru in the middle, a facilitator. And there's so many examples of that on the internet. Um, a really good one actually is um, Martin, I'm not sure of his last name, but he's building a marble machine. You may remember, Mar just look up marble machine. Uh, he's in the band Winter Garden. And look at the process by which he's building the new marble machine and how his whole community are learning together through YouTube and other social media. There's many, many other examples. Now, what I think we could be doing is building a platform of open education technology of OER and this open recognition so that a guru can just pull off the shelf everything they need for free. And I mean, really for free, like not with all the uh, fine print of what YouTube 
is, which is selling your data and advertising and monetizing on your data. Um, but a true open education platform that uh, this, a person like this can use. And then that person is now empowered to, to grow and teach a huge group of people um, uh, through the internet. Now, I'm not saying this would happen outside of institutions. I think every lecturer in every institution should have the same mindset that they are the guru with all these tools and they're able to create a community around themselves. And if you like, that teacher kind of docks. They might have their own platform that they dock with the institution's platform. So yeah, you enroll in some university and you now have access to that teacher who is associated with that university uh, and you join that community. So there's possibilities here to really kind of use what works, but in a new way that promotes quality, that promotes um, uh, research and science uh, and facts, uh, and just a high quality of education to really start producing citizens uh, for the world. So in short, I, I just want to encourage everyone, no matter where you are or what you're doing, fight to keep uh, education technology open. We need to. I think if we don't, there's possibilities for very large companies to start taking over the education space. And once they do that, um, they will also take over the future of the planet. And I don't think that's what everybody wants. Here's some of my contact details. If you want to get in touch, very happy to uh, talk with you. Thank you for listening. Um, and thanks for the opportunity. Have a great conference. See ya.